Hi, I'm Professor Nigel Dunnett, a Professor in Plasma Design and Vegetation Technology at the University of Sheffield, Department of Massive Architecture. I'm also Director of the Green Roof Centre at the University of Sheffield, which we've established for the last five years as the, the main point of contact, main research centre for green roof activity within the UK. My background is in ecology, horticulture, planting design, um, botany, plant science, and I really bring all these together in my research and my teaching and a lot of practice as well in terms of designing and implementing sustainable, richly planted landscapes in towns and cities. I guess my whole focus is in sustainable public planting. Um, and that just doesn't involve what happens on the ground around buildings, but on the building and the linkage between the two, particularly biodiversity and water. And I guess that's what I bring to Green Roofs, the idea of um, real diversity in planting. But I guess the special factor that uh, I've always been interested in is not just creating sustainable planting, naturalistic landscapes rich for wildlife, but creating a real wow factor for people as well in a way that's sustainable but also exciting. I've called this presentation Integrating People and Nature, Sustainable Green Roofs and Roof Gardens and it really brings together a lot of my ideas on planting, creating, designing green roofs uh, with high aesthetic value for people but which are great for wildlife at the same time and I've subtitled it Sky Meadows which I think encapsulates the aesthetic that I strive for which is highly colourful, highly naturalistic, really attractive but also providing a lot of resources for wildlife. My background is in horticulture, ecology, plant science and botany and I bring all of these together, together with landscape design in my teaching and in my research and in the application of that research into practice and I have a lot of ongoing projects of many different types, a lot of which are green roof projects but a lot of which are on buildings uh, and around buildings but incorporating the idea of uh, naturalistic planting with great attraction for people and wildlife. My inspiration always starts with dramatic flowering landscapes in the wild and this is a nice example. I took this picture of a prairie in the springtime just outside Chicago and um, it's a highly diverse system, very species rich but it's also very simple visually. The, the main visual effect is created by just one or two species. The main one here is the dodecathion, fantastic pink mauve uh, flowers scattered all throughout with some yellow violas as well. This gives the key really um, to the way I design with plants. It's looking at uh, a few key species which create the dominant visual effect and which are repeated throughout to give this huge feeling of drama and scale. There's a lot of green in here. Uh, this is all the developing foliage of the grasses and the perennials which will come up and flower later on providing a real succession uh, of display and flowering right the way through to the fall. And of course all these shorter earlier flowering species are hidden away. And again that gives a good idea of successional type of planting giving maximum value from the same area of space for as long as possible which again is a key principle. It's quite different from a lot of landscape design where maybe a different part of a garden or a landscape looks good at a different time of the year. I try and make the same area look good for as long as possible through this idea of successional planting. Now I apply these ideas uh, through naturalistic uh, landscape design and planting design in urban public places largely and this is typical, it's a, a meadow created uh, in a housing area, residential area in the city of Sheffield, we have a lot of these. This is quite different from a, a, a natural meadow or a nature area or preserve that people might choose to go and visit, which might be in a special area, or let's say in the wild area of a park or a nature garden. This is right up where people live, where they work, and to walk through it or walk by it or drive by it. It's uh, there every day and there is no choice about the matter and therefore it has to look really good but it has to be sustainable there's limited budgets to look after it and we really want to bring wildlife and, and really ecological benefit as close as possible and to achieve all of these things in such high profile places around where people are using them all the time we really do have to think about how they look as well as how good they are for wildlife which means largely this idea of pepped up or enhanced colour long flowering display and simple maintenance and it's exactly the same sort of principle that I bring to green roof design. Now these ideas and this type of planting in our work at Sheffield has taken off all around the country and in many other countries we have many projects of this type. 
Our biggest project is currently the 2012 uh, London Olympic Park, which is a huge site. And myself and my colleague James Hitchum are the principal planting design and horticultural consultants for the site. There's very little standard landscape type here, such as formal bedding or uh, shrub planting. In fact, most of the uh, non-tree, non-woody landscape is colourful long-season meadow, naturalistic perennial plantings over large areas. Uh, but we've also worked a lot with uh, water as the main guiding principle to the way the landscape is structured. And so alongside all the path networks, there are dramatic bioswales. And this gives another clue to the way that I work in terms of landscape planting and landscape design being multifunctional, uh, looking good, but having real environmental benefit as well. And of course, these swales do just that, collecting and infiltrating water. Uh, but, but looking really dramatic as well, and uh, many people seeing them may not even realise that they have this environmental function. But I firmly believe that if we're going to do that in a public landscape or in a private landscape, it has to look really good if we're really going to get this uh, approach to um, landscape planting taken up on a much wider scale. Now this dramatic, large-scale, colourful, flowering, ecological landscape is what I do and it's what I love. And um, I found 10 or 12 years ago that I've been working a lot on the ground in lots of different applications, wetlands, woodlands, meadows, and just about the only place that I hadn't been working was on the buildings rather than around them. And I knew about green roofs and I'd seen a lot of them on travels to Germany. But um, comparing the sorts of things I've just been showing you with what I saw on a lot of green roofs, I found the visual effect to be less than exciting. It lacked that drama, that spectacle. Um, and that visual interest that uh, that I really like to work with. Um, this is actually a nice example of a mixed seed and roof, uh, but of course many of them uh, have a lot less visual interest even than this. But I did see quite a lot of uh, uh, old green roofs in Germany that I really took took my uh, attention, such as this one here, um, our flower meadow on top of a building. It captures that sense of drama which I talked about before, and again that that same essence of design. Uh, that I talked about in the prairie, where we have just one or two key species, in this case, Dianthus carthusianorum, uh, repeating itself throughout, providing that strong visual element. This is highly sustainable as a landscape type uh, for a green roof, in requiring probably no maintenance or certainly a simple cutback every now, every year or every few years. And uh, looking more recently at, at old uh, green roofs in Germany, uh, I saw this one with my colleague Christine Thuring and um, again it just has a lot of real strong visual interest. Uh, in the foreground we have Veronica, in the background large areas of Dianthus, Dianthus carthusianorum again, um, and in the middle uh, expanses of yellow allium, really beautiful. And again this is really inspiring to me and it's relatively simple to achieve and uh, the planting possibilities and the use of different plants is is really endless in these sorts of combinations and the maintenance is very simple if maintenance there is at all. Now um, a lot of these ideas became formulated when I wrote this book with Noel Kingsbury in 2003, Planting Green Roofs and Living Walls. We tried in this book which was the first mainstream English language book which brought together a lot of the research and tried to interpret it and explain it to a much wider audience. Um, and now it's in its uh, second edition, going very strong. The publishers were amazed that uh, there was such a demand for a book like this, which they thought would be a, a very narrow niche interest market. But it became quite clear to me when I was researching this book, and it's become even more clear to me since then, that we're bound by so many rules and rigid ways of thinking. It's either right or wrong, you do things this way if you want to do things properly, or you do things another way if you don't do want to do things properly. Um, and the green roof world is as guilty as that of anything. Um, in fact, the very basic fundamental division of green roofs into extensive and intensive is an example of this, where we see the intensive roof garden as being predominantly for people, uh, being accessible, and uh, in many cases, of course, it's just a repeat of exactly the sort of quite sterile landscapes you find on the ground, whereas extensive green roofs are ecological, uh, structures and layers providing stormwater management and wildlife and habitat value and so on and a large ecological and seen for biodiversity or for nature. Uh, this division is, is completely artificial, one for people, one for nature. 
and really my work and my thinking is about bringing the two together. So really I approach green roofs asking questions like can intensive green roofs, of which I have quite a, quite a good interest, can they be good for wildlife, require low resource inputs and have ecological benefit just like extensive green roofs? In other words, can extensive and semi-extensive green roof techniques be used to create beautiful spaces on top of roofs that people can enjoy? But similarly, can extensive and semi-extensive green roofs be really beautiful, really stunning? And is it just the intensive green roof that's designed primarily for aesthetic effect? And when you start to think like this, then you start to work with every green roof uh, to think, well, what, what is the possible maximum it can achieve? Uh, we're all very familiar with all the different benefits that green roofs give us. Well, when we approach every single project or every single green roof, can we try and tick off as many of these different characteristics as we possibly can on the same roof, rather than trying to see different roofs as having benefits in different ways. So I tend to think more about sustainable living roofs. Uh, and my definition of those is, is roofs which, uh, green roofs which require low resource input, really the minimum necessary to sustain the objectives that are desired for them. That relates to water, the energy embodied in the materials used in the green roof, the energy required to keep it going and its maintenance, things like fertiliser and labour of course. Simple easy maintenance is key, uh, creating beautiful long season visual impact like I've said with high biodiversity value and these last two are not mutually exclusive or incompatible, in fact I very much try and do both at the same time. This uh, for me in my area of uh, planting design and plant science is about appropriate plant selection, choosing the right plants for the right place. And uh, as we know, we've only really started to scratch the tip of the iceberg there. It's about the way we arrange plants, the way we put them together, the design methodology, which again contributes to the sustainability of a green roof. And the maintenance program, the maintenance techniques which are embodied in that. In terms of plant selection, plant and design, the key things, of course, are the tolerance of the moisture regime on the roof. That's related to the depth of substrate and also the maintenance needs that... Uh, that the different plant species use and those all these all have to come into consideration as I'll, I'll show a bit later on. When selecting plants uh, in this ecological way there are two main approaches that, that can be taken. Uh, the first most common one is to look to local regional habitats with similar environmental conditions to the rooftop. Now my wording here is quite precise and it's different to I guess a lot of the guidance or the immediate response to this approach that people come up with. I'm not saying local vegetation from around where the building or development is or the sort of vegetation or plant species that would have been there pre-development. I think that's a really misguided way of thinking in terms of an ecological green roof approach because if you think about it the rooftop uh, environment or habitat is completely different to what you might have found pre-development in that region. Uh, the urban heat island elevates temperatures uh, by many degrees, of course. The soils are completely artificial and bear no relation to what you find on the ground. Uh, wind and exposure and sunlight are all different, and therefore um, many plant species, if not most, that you would find naturally growing around the development or pre-development would just not be suitable to have on a, a certainly an extensive roof. But looking to local or regional habitats within the same climatic zone um, that may be appropriate of course has a lot of potential they may be some distance from where the development is but they may have similar environmental conditions that's one approach uh, a second approach is to look to world habitats with similar environmental conditions this is a much more liberal approach where the context allows it um, and it's looking uh, to use suitable plant species from suitable habitats um, that might come together to form a functioning artificial plant community on the rooftop but where we can perhaps play around with the aesthetics. And with all of these approaches, it's absolutely essential to undertake research and trial work to really find out what grows and what persists in any given region. Just uh, some local examples to me of the sorts of uh, way that I look at this. Uh, I saw this plant species called Erinus alpinus on a... Uh, Tombstone headstone on a graveyard cemetery in London, flowering on bare rock in just the smallest cracks in the in the rock, uh, virtually no soil or no soil there, uh, but growing extremely vigorously and 
uh, flowering very well and this is just the sort of plant that we use now this is actually its native habitat in the UK is northern upland areas and uh, very different to the, the London urban environment but it's found its own particular niche here a native habitat that we might look at uh, includes this which is in the southeast of England Dungeness huge area of uh, shingle we say pebbles or stones coastal uh, very low rainfall in fact the uh, rainfall amount is officially classifies this as a desert uh, it's all stone so the drainage is extremely free there's no soil there uh, and yet there's a very extensive vegetation developed here lots of sedums grasses and flowering plants the white flowering plant which again is doing this repetition of a key dominant species throughout giving the main visual effect is C. campion Silene maritima and it's one that used quite a lot on uh, green roofs. But looking elsewhere, uh, the possibilities are endless. For example, um, this is uh, South African uh, dryland vegetation flowering after spring rains, lots of succulents here, dramatic flowering vegetation. Uh, it's just the sort of visual impact that I might look to draw inspiration from from a green roof and around the world of course there are many such um, startling dry land vegetations. Uh, in the States there are many examples of this sort of thing as well. But it's not just this type of vegetation, dry meadows, uh, upland alpine coastal and so on, provides a really good starting point. When I first started to think this way, um, I set up my first plant trials in 1999. I didn't really know what I was doing then. Uh, I had seen the green in Germany, uh, I'd been a little bit disappointed with a lot of what I saw and I thought well in the UK where we have a slightly warmer winter, a bit more rain in the summer, we might be able to grow a different range of plants than in the continental climate of central Germany where the summers are very hot and relatively dry and the winters are very cold. So I got together around 30 different plant species that grew naturally in dry meadow habitats, largely European, uh, perennials, flowering perennials and grasses and um, mixed them in uh, plant groupings that I thought would provide a long season of display when it all came together and looked at different substrate depths and different amounts of irrigation, no irrigation or some irrigation and just wanted to see which plant species survived and which didn't over the long term and uh, in the first year after planting up it looked like this in the springtime but it also looked like this in the fall with no maintenance whatsoever and it's the same principle I talked about early on of successional planting, successional flowering, where later things come up and flower and the earlier, shorter things are hidden away. And this, even this simple trial proved very informative to me. These red hot pokers, the South African perennials for example, have been a real re revelation. They persist in shallow substrates with no irrigation with, with us in Sheffield for uh, a decade now or more. We use these results and many more that we've done since to inform the sort of planting and approaches we take onto green roofs and we've looked at a whole range of different plant groups as well as the grasses and the perennials and the succulents, annuals or bulbs for example and these are some of the early trials but now um, we have a very large scale plant screening program funded by the European Union in uh, partnership with uh, Zinco, the German green roof company and we have a full-time team of employees now or researchers on this project, uh, 11 or 12 of them, not just looking at planting but also at other aspects of green roof development in the context of climate change scenarios. But our green roof trials are large scale, they're the largest international plant screening program going on at the moment. We're looking initially at about four or five hundred species. We are controlling the conditions very carefully, different substrate depths and different amounts of water added to find the optimal growing conditions for um, each species that we are using. And this is part of the, the trial set up in the newly established trials. These structures here are rain shelters which will uh, prevent rainfall over part of the experiment and allows us to uh, add uh, very specified amounts of water to really test the moisture requirements of all these different species. And this is a counterpart set up uh, in Germany. So we have the same plant species grown under the more continental climate of uh, Stuttgart and the more maritime climate of Sheffield and it allows us a real cross climatic comparison of the same plant species. Now 
to change tack slightly over the last decade or so, one of the main movements in green roof design in, in Europe has been uh, the development of ideas to support biodiversity, uh, really led by the work of Stefan Vernason and, and Dusty Gedge here in the UK. And I guess many real lessons have come out of this, one of which is the um, benefit of playing around with the topography, not, not just having a single depth or a flat roof, but mounding up or changing the level of or the depth of the substrate. And uh, this can have quite profound effects on the vegetation. Now, this is one of our early green roofs in Sheffield that we worked with, I guess six or seven years ago, where we sowed a single green roof seed mix containing sedums, grasses, perennials over the entire surface, but the depth of the substrate varied across that surface. And simply the change in depth of substrate has had a big effect on the vegetation. Here you can see the greener patches where the grasses and perennials have established. That's where the substrate is slightly deeper. Where there's pretty much bare ground, that's where it's very shallow, and where there are just sedums, it's intermediate. And you can start to see the design possibilities of, of, of simple, simple manipulation of substrate with seed mixes like this where the vegetation sorts itself out. Now, um, to show this in a bit more scientific detail, the result of surveys that we've done, this graph here compares the depth of substrate, which is along the x-axis, the bottom, going f up to uh, 70 or 80 millimetres, uh, 2, 3, 4 inches. Now, on the y-axis, we have the percentage cover of the vegetation, in this case grasses, going up to 50-60%. Uh, there's a very strong linear relationship here. As the substrate becomes deeper, we have more and more grass cover up to about 50% of the deeper substrate levels. And that's related to uh, moisture supply, maybe nutrient supply in increasing substrate depth. This is exactly the opposite relationship showing the amount of bare ground. So where we have the shallower substrate, there's much more ground, almost 100% in the shallower areas going up to um, maybe 90% coverage where there is uh, a deeper substrate. So there's much more bare ground in the shallow areas, very little bare ground where the substrate is deeper. The sedums show a different pattern. They, they pretty much are independent of substrate growth in their establishment, uh, but they, they're less obvious because of the other things that are growing around them in the deeper substrates. So we have this, this patterning, this, uh, this visual effect uh, this was ta this pitch was taken in the earlier stages of the green roof development here. Uh, this pitch was taken last year, and it shows just how this this starts to pan out. Now, in the foreground, we have uh, the, the deeper substrate areas with flowering perennials and grasses, real sky meadow. In the background, are the sedum only areas, which you can just about see as yellow mass. I mentioned about some of the the rules and assumptions coming out of the uh, the biodiversity movement. Now. Um, one of the, the, the two or three main conclusions that come out of this and the key things that really do promote biodiversity are variation in the vegetation types across a roof as we see here, maybe variation in the substrate characteristics of the surface having open stony areas which basking invertebrates like to use. Absolute key is diversity in vegetation structure, having taller grasses, maybe taller perennials, shorter growing things, species which have good overwintering structure to allow shelter for invertebrates. So this diversity in plant forms, but also high diversity in plant planting type or plant diversity, particularly flowering plant diversity to encourage as many pollinators as possible. Now all of these factors can be used in green roof design without the need necessary to slavishly copy native plant communities because the actual plant composition of the roof, so long as you work with high diversity of flowering plant species and vegetation structure, is much, much less important than those first factors. In fact, to encourage pollinators, the, the actual origin of the plant isn't necessarily important, so long as it's appropriate. Of course, there are very strong relationships with uh, certain invertebrates and feed plants or, or plants which eggs are laid upon, but these are specialists. Uh, for general biodiversity support, biodiversity support, then um, we can be really liberal again with the plants that we use and still achieve exactly the same effect. Uh, in fact, what you see here is largely not native to the UK. The sedums are, are not native originally. Uh, the yellow uh, daisy plant is Anthemis tinctoria, a very common dry meadow plant 
uh, in many European countries, but not native to the UK. The Petragia saxifraga is not native. So this is largely a non-native sky meadow, and yet it's fantastic for wildlife. And it looks great to all the people who are overlooking it. I want to enlarge upon these ideas with a couple of examples. The first of which is, is uh, one of our oldest green roofs that we've worked with in this way in Sheffield. Uh, a business centre, Morgate Crofts, opened in 2005, and I did the planting design for this with the landscape architect who set out the, the main concept for the building. And the, the main green roof area is a communal green roof where the people who work in the building can come up and, and sit up there and use it. The brief was for it to be extremely low maintenance, low input, for it to be colourful and good looking year round and to require uh, little or no irrigation. The planting design was very simple here. We worked with two or three uh, plant mixes set out in broad sweeps and bounds. Uh, I never really worked with a detailed planting design showing the location of every single plant species. That's, that's a bit of a waste of time on a green roof. Uh, but I worked with mixes and showed the location of the mixes. And here we've spot located just a few of the species to, to, to provide definite structure. This is the green roof under construction. The substrate depth, crushed brick based substrate, was uh, 100 millimeters to 200 millimeters. That's three to four inches to five to six inches, varied across the roof. This roof was planted up with small uh, pot grown material in nine centimeter pots. Uh, typically now I, I would use seeding, it's much cheaper and gives them a naturalistic effect or a combination of planting and seeding to plant up a large scale roof just with plants like this, particularly larger plants rather than plugs, is very expensive. Uh, we set out uh, using a randomly planted technique. These uh, Each individual species was put into groups of four or five and then those groups were randomly distributed with all the other groups of individual species uh, throughout the different planting zones, giving a very spontaneous effect. Uh, this is an aerial photograph of the completed roof, and you can see that banding or that zonation that uh, was in the plan quite quite well. Those lighter areas, the paler areas, where the planting is, is relatively sparse, or it appears sparse, uh, are mulched down with stony gravel. And again, that gives that open stony surface in places, which is uh, has been shown to be really important for certain types of invertebrates, but our planting is not at all restricted to just the recreation of a native plant community. In fact, we have probably 30 to 40 percent native wildflowers here and 60, 70 percent non-native. The planting effect goes right back to that prairie picture I showed. There were a few dominant species repeated throughout the roof, giving that large-scale drama. The alley and the chives, the uh, yellow Irish relative Cicerinchium, and the grey-leaved stack is here, and also there are clumps of the white-flowered sea pink, the sea campion that I showed earlier on in its natural habitat. In the back there you can see those South African red-hot pokers which uh, have persisted there on this roof for now seven or eight years. And uh, again it shows the direct link with the research and the trials that we do to show what does really work on an experimental basis. We put those onto real roofs and we have a, a real sense of a guarantee of success on, as, as, the, uh, as we know that these uh, practice examples are research based. The great thing about working in this way is that you have the large scale drama through the repetition and the sheer sense of scale but even at the smallest level, the square yard or the square meter, you get a huge amount of visual diversity and detail and fascination. I think this variety or this visual delight at different scales is a real key feature of this approach to planting design. And here you can see this diverse mix of grasses, of perennials, there's sedums in there, there's bulbs. Uh, and, it, and it really gives rise to the successional display over a long season that I've talked about before. And here you get a sense again if you look closely at the uh, open stony nature of the, the, the surface. Now we've done a lot of surveys of green roofs around Sheffield of all different types, sedum based, grassy types, native, uh, non-native, uh, mixed like this one. And time and time again, this green roof comes out as by being by far the best for general biodiversity support. General biodiversity support, uh, far better than, than some green roofs that we've designed specifically using biodiversity rules and native plants only. And this, this real biodiversity richness comes across largely because of this variety in form and structure, but in particular because of the huge diversity of planting that we've got in here. 
The really interesting thing about this approach as well is that over time the green roof develops, it changes, it's dynamic, it's not static. The maintenance is not there to try and keep it in one particular state. And the more dominant species take over uh, and become more abundant, the less successful species may not survive so much. So there's a great deal of change over time. Um, this, this particular roof has become a little bit more wild, a bit more relaxed over uh, the last six or seven years. The maintenance is very simple. We do a sim single cut back at the end of the winter in February and all the cuttings are taken away. It's really a meadow management regime. That regime does give a very dramatic effect in the spring because we have a clean starting surface and a lot of spring flowering plants come up against that, uh, come out against that clean surface. The yellow here, uh, scattered throughout, again giving the sky meadow effect, is quite a common wild, or a very common wildflower of dry free draining calcareous soils in the UK and Europe, it's Primula veris, uh, the cowslip. Mixed in here with another very rare UK uh, species of dry calcareous grassland, the pask flower, Pulsatilla vulgaris. And this lovely mixture of cowslips and pask flowers, uh, together with the fine leaf grasses, developing a real sky meadow, uh, is very, very special. And it gives a hint to me of what just can be achieved on a green roof situation. If I try to recreate this diverse meadow type vegetation, very special vegetation on the ground around this business development or commercial development, I'd never be able to do it. It just isn't appropriate. I'd never be allowed to do it, never, never get it past a client. Um, but to do it on the green roof surface is relatively easy. There's been no problem. And we can create the most spectacular and diverse and special vegetations in a way that's just not possible at ground level. In fact, the richness, the diversity of this stylized, designed limestone meadow, which is quite similar in its appearance to what we might find in the wild. The diversity is very high and it's um, in the middle of a business park in a city and the potential to do a lot more of this, of course, is very clear. Being an academic and a researcher, of course, we, we use these roofs a lot and we know exactly where all the different plants are. And it really is a very important tool for us to be able to monitor these year after year and to see how they develop. It teaches a lot of lessons about um, the processes involved in green roof development and design. Second example is perhaps even more special. This is the Sharrow School in Sheffield, which is four years old now. Again, I did the plant and design uh, and vegetation specification for this roof. The brief was very much to create an urban wildlife haven uh, in an inner city area in Sheffield, uh, particularly with a focus on urban vegetation, the sort of important vegetation that develops on urban derelict sites or brownfield sites, post-industrial sites. But because this is a very high profile project and because school groups and children are going up there all the time, it had to look really exciting and it had to really capture the imagination of children. Uh, and to also provide a huge amount of educational benefit. We took exactly the same approach, the Sky Meadow approach, uh, providing colourful, long season vegetation. The maintenance here is minimal, there's very little resource for maintenance. And so we had to make it very simple to look after. Again, it's a mix of native wildflower species, but also some additional things to provide extra visual display, such as this meadow here, which is a largely artificial meadow, and yet this is the first thing that children see when they come up and it, um, as they walk up the, the, the steps of the side of the roof and this, this viewpoint comes out across, uh, it produces, produces a huge sense of wonder and I think this is really important that we don't forget the visual aesthetic effect of these large scale displays. Of course it's buzzing with bees and butterflies as well. I took this picture uh, just uh, six or seven weeks ago uh, showing the effect now of Dianthus carthusianorum scattered across, of course, lots of uh, alliums, sedums, and various other things here. Uh, this gets to cut back once a year, if, if that, maybe less than that. Now, the really special thing about this green roof is that it, uh, in 2009, was awarded a UK government designation as a nature reserve. Um, this is the only UK green roof which has been designed for, for wildlife habitat to receive a government designation of, of biodiversity value. In fact, as far as I'm aware, it's the only one in the world that has received official government um, recognition for its biodiversity value and protection. Natural England is the UK government's nature conservation agency and they designated this a local nature reserve 
because of its in incredible wildlife habitat, but also because of its educational value. This is a really special thing for two reasons. Firstly, it is official recognition that green roofs do serve a real biodiversity value, a real wildlife habitat value in towns and cities. But secondly, because we've used the Sky Manor approach, we've used this mix of techniques and planting to really maximise the visual effect and the excitement and drama for people, as well as maximising at the same time the biodiversity value. Again, this has received re official designation and support as a valid technique, which allows us to go ahead and do a lot more of it. So that's it then, the idea of Sky Meadows. It's all about integrating people and nature on the rooftop for the benefit of both. You can find out more from my website, more information on all the activities I'm involved with, nigeldunnett.info, or my email address is n.dunnett at sheffield.ac.uk.